Okay, welcome everybody to the fifth digital transformation for the steel industry webinar. This is the fifth webinar out of 13 digital transformation webinar organized during the summer here at AAST. These webinars are presentations taken from the Digital Transformation Forum, which was originally uh, scheduled in March 2020 and was unfortunately uh, postponed due to the COVID-19 pandemic. The organizing committee has reorganized some of these presentations into this Digital Transformation webinar series. Last week, we got the privilege to listen to John Devins, Vice President Customer Success at Canvas Analytics and Bankatesh Muthusami, Senior Data Scientist at Canvas Analytics, present how AI, how AI is increasing production quality in steel manufacturing. Today, we have the great pleasure to listen to Albert Becerra, Electrical and Automation Supervisor for Coated Products at Big River Steel, and Andrew Dahl, uh, Advanced Analytics Process Engineer at OnPoint. The title of their presentation today is Applying Machine Learning to Eliminate CGL Strip Weld Failures. My name is Alicia and I'm the Staff Engineer at the, uh, for the Digitalization Applications Technology Committee here at the Station for Iron and Steel Technology. Before we start the webinar today, I want to go through some reminders for the attendees. Please note that the attendee audio has been disabled. Um, questions to the presenter should be submitted via the chat feature and the host and the moderator will determine which questions that will be presented to the presenter at the end of this webinar. Uh, please note that this session is being recorded and uh, the recordings will be available for on-demand replay on AST's website. If you have any technical difficulties, please contact training at AST.org. Please note that photos and recordings of presentations are prohibited and you will be provided a link to access the presenter approved presentations and recording following the end of the webinar. Uh, due to the large sizes of these files, please allow two to three days before they will be available online. If you have noted that there are some of the previous webinars that would not be available, this is because we are still waiting for presenter approval for those. I would also like to announce the AIST antitrust guidelines, which emphasizes the antitrust law that prohibits agreements between individuals to regulate prices and to hinder or limit a competitor. I would also like to present the AST anti-harassment policy, which emphasizes the importance to provide a harassment-free environment, regardless of age, race, disability, or gender. Ebay, I would like to uh, thank the sponsors for the event today, uh, OnPoint TM. Uh, OnPoint TM, uh, formerly known as EFT Analytics, uh, as you may know, delivers real-time insights and enhanced systems performance across a variety of industrial domains. The on-point portfolio of digital solutions harnesses deep domain expertise to deliver advanced, actionable insights that help operators identify root causes, analyze performance, and optimize their equipment and operations. So thank you very much to the sponsors, uh, sponsor of this event. I would hereby like to uh, introduce to you the moderator for the webinar today, uh, Christopher Burnett, uh, Business Development Manager at Thermo Fisher Scientific. Christopher Burnett is currently uh, the Business Development Manager Goging at uh, Thermo Fisher Scientific. He previously had positions within Thermo Fisher as Technical Product Manager, Director of Sensor Development, Manager of Systems Integrations and Systems Production, Field Service Manager, Radiation Safety Officer, and R&D R &D Physicist. Burnett has been a member of AAST since 2004 and has served as a chair for the Electrical Applications Technology Committee. 
He currently serves as a member of the AST Foundation Digital Transformation Technologies Grant Committee. So I would hereby like to give the word to the moderator for the webinar today, Chris Burnett. Well, thank you, Alicia. It's my pleasure to be uh, representing on the Digital Transformation Technology Core Committee. Um, we've really put a lot of effort into selecting the various presentations and while we're not able to meet personally in Pittsburgh, uh, we are very pleased and proud to put together this program virtually for everybody. I'd like to start off by introducing our two presenters. Uh, Alvera Bracera is the Electrical and Automation Supervisor for Coded Products at Big River Steel. He previously worked as an automation engineer throughout the startup and commissioning of Big River Steel's new continuous galvanizing line. Vicera has more than 20 years experience in the steel industry, working in several plants in three different countries. He has held several positions in the maintenance management field and his expertise is focused on flat product processing. Um, the next presenter, uh, the co-presenter is Andrew Dole. He is uh, an advanced analytics process engineer for OnPoint. Uh, as, uh, Alicia mentioned OnPoint specializes in delivering digital solutions for clients in the steel and manufacturing industries. Andrew's role where he works with uh, directly with clients to deliver both real-time and static machine learning solutions. His previous experience as a senior process engineer and uh, various operations leadership roles allows him to identify clients needs and rapidly apply analytics to their data and deliver practical solutions. So with that brief introduction, I'd like to turn it over to, uh, to Andrew. Good morning, everyone. Thanks for being here. Andrew and I are going to start presenting the project that we developed in our continuous galvanizing line at Big River Steel with the company OnPoint. The name is Applying Machine Learning to Eliminate CGL Strip Weld Failures. Okay, let's go over the agenda. First, we're going to define the problem. Let's, uh, then we are going to talk about the strategy that we follow to try to solve the problem. Then we are going to understand the process and we are going to understand what was the data that we had available and how did we select the proper data to create the analysis and to create the modeling. Then we are going to talk about the implementation and how what this process um, was going. And at the end, we are going to talk about the results. So let's start with the uh, problem. Um, the Welding machine in, a, in the continuous line is the most important equipment. Uh, the continuous line's uh, core is to keep the process line continuous, just to guarantee that the all throughout the coil, the quality and the properties for the material will be constant. So this makes very, very important that the equipment is going to work, uh, is working perfectly. Um, uh, the first year of operation, we had uh, many problems with this equipment. And the problems was, um, or they were focused in two uh, topics. The first is uh, where the re-welds. Every single time that the operator makes a weld and that the, when the quality is not the right one, the operator needs to stop the process and makes a re-weld. Every single time that he's doing this, he needs to decrease the process in the speed in the process area that could affect the quality of the product. And if the time is not enough, the operator needs to stop the line to make the re-weld, to have a good weld, and that creates cost to the process. The second problem we have is uh, when the operator believes with his criteria that the weld sink was good enough to make it from the entry to the exit of the line, but for some reason, due to the strip tension and the bends, when it's uh, going through all the rolls in the line, we have the strip breaks. So when the strip breaks, uh, depends on where the strip broke, 
depends the time that we need to put the line together to start the line again. If, it's, if, the, if the strip breaks around the welder, we could solve the problem in less than two hours and we can be running again. But if the problem happened and we have the strip break inside the furnace, that means that we need more than 30 hours, a lot of people working uh, to start the line again. This is the, the, the worst case scenario and that had happened uh, or that happened in the first years of operation. And the, the statistics that we had that says that we had one street break per month and some of them were inside the forms. Uh, the root cause of the why we had the low quality wealth, it was not determined by that time. Okay. Um, how, how did we detect the problems? So we had two ways. One is uh, right away when the well seam is, is, or the well is made, and this is hydraulic barge test, and we are going to talk about this in the next slide. And then every single time we had either a rig weld or a street break, <clears throat> excuse me, we went over the IBA data to perform the analysis. The IBA data is uh, our uh, high speed process data recording when we have all the, the, the signals that we have straight in the welder and all in the entry of the line. So every single time that we have an event, we went over the data to analyze how all the control loops and all the variables that add to have a good weld perform. If we put uh, a little bit more uh, color of this, we have uh, variables as current, <clears throat> the electrical current, the pressure, the speed, the overlap. Uh, these variables are measured by the or measured by the PLC and they are transferred to the IBA. So when we were with the analysis, when we were over the analysis, we checked if the control loops were working properly. And what does that mean? That means that we check if every single variable follow the set point that the operator shows at the very beginning of the well scene. And most of the cases, we found that everything was working perfect. So the big question mark we had was, everything was working perfectly, but we still had uh, street breaks and rig welds. And that was the problem. Uh, this is the reason or that this is not the problem that led us to start the project with on point in January uh, 2019. The goal of the project was uh, eliminate, I mean, first find the root cause to eliminate the rig welds and eliminate the uh, street breaks. It's a huge uh, risk and when we could not continue working that way. Okay, let's go over the system. How are we performing the weld and let, to understand the process a little bit more. At the very beginning, the operator knows what is the material that he's going to uh, weld. The coil that is in the line and the next coil that is going to be fit to the welder. So the operator with this data choose from the available set of tables which one is the setup table that fits these materials. The operator selects this manually and also he has the availability, I mean, he's available to modify the set points according with his experience. Experience welding similar materials or experience welding exactly the same material with positive uh, results. So after the operator selects all the data, he press the automatic button in the HMI. After that happens, after that happened, the machine fully automatically makes the weld. At the very end of the, of the weld, the machine cuts both edges, operator side and drive side. This is known as a notches. And then the operator takes every single one of these notches and take them to the hydraulic Bosch test. The hydraulic Bosch test is a machine that has a hydraulic cylinder. And the function of the objective of this, um, machine is to press or put high pressure around the area where the weld seam is with the 
with the goal to break it. So as you can see in the photo that is displayed in the presentation, you can see that it's like a circle and inside is the well seam that is, uh, is uh, broken. So depending on how the, the well seam is, is uh, uh, broke, the operator makes the decision either if it's okay to send it to the process or if it's not good and he needs to make a reword. Okay, now uh, after we establish all the, the, the goal for the project, I will give this uh, to Andrew to continue. Thanks, Albert. So with any uh, <clears throat> analytics project, um, I like to start off with uh, uh, stuff that we learned in grade school. Um, so uh, the correlation I'm making here is that data science is really no different than the scientific method that we learn as children. Um, so with the scientific method, we're taught that uh, you can make an observation, develop a hypothesis for why that observation is occurring, uh, experiment and collect data to support that hypothesis, and analyze the results to find out if, if you've uh, defined the, the root cause for why you're making that observation. Data science is really uh, not that different. Um, <clears throat> we're defining our goals, uh, developing a hypothesis for what could potentially be causing, uh, in this case, um, uh, poor quality welds. Uh, we're collecting data and testing the hypothesis. Uh, a lot of times we already have completed the experimentations unknowingly, um, and we're analyzing the results. So when it comes to defining the goal, uh, my recommendation uh, is to start clearly and simply, because if you can't do that here, it only serves to convolute the entire process. Um, ideally, there's a concrete way to measure the results of, of an analytics project um, and uh, measure those results and compare them to previous performance. So with this project, it was fairly straightforward. Um, we wanted to figure out how we can operate to get the best weld possible and eliminate the need for rewelds and strip breaks, which cost uh, downtime. We went through several different hypotheses, but two uh, rose to the top as we were doing our analysis. Uh, the first one was that the difference between the set points and the actuals in the twin, twin lap welding machine is causing the defective welds. The second one is that welds fail because the wrong set points are being used. <clears throat> the next step is to collect data to test our hypotheses against the intent of the scientific method is to direct experimentation to get the data that is needed. Um, but with Industry 4.0 data collection, many times these experiments have been unknowingly executed um, and we're just looking for the signal and the noise uh, to validate our hypotheses. Um, so with the uh, uh, data infrastructure at BRS, uh, uh, it, it is very good. They, have, uh, they collect data on thousands of variables um, hundreds on uh, just the twin lap welding machine alone. Um, and as Albert mentioned, they had previously connected the PLC of the welder to IBA, um, which stored the clean time series data. So as far as analysis uh, goes, it's, it's pretty straightforward. Um, we had data available for about 12,000 welds in a variety of gauges and grades. Um, however, we didn't have very good historical data on which welds failed in the process. Um, and we'll go over how we got around that uh, here shortly. Um, so like I said, uh, many of you are going to be familiar with uh, looking at this sort of data. Uh, it is time series data. Um, and we're actually zoomed in here. Um, you can see it's not a very friendly format to analyze, um, especially for humans, right? When Albert talked about how they would do root cause analysis, if a weld failed, they would, they would zoom in to these 10 seconds uh, that occur roughly every 10 or 15 minutes and, and look at the uh, parameters that, that led, and led to the resulting weld. Um, you can see pretty quickly that uh, even if there is a pattern here across 12,000 uh, welds, um, it would be very difficult for a human to analyze. So there's a lot more data than is necessary. Um, and talking about how, uh, uh, how we defined our target, um, Albert talked about how uh, an operator would make a reweld if they made an evaluation of that bulge test and decided it wasn't good enough to send through the process. They actually would, would click a button on the Taylor Winfield and uh, uh, tell it to reweld perhaps with new 
uh, set points, um, and that flag was available in the data. Um, so if we gave each weld a unique identifying number, uh, looked at which ones were, were re-welds, uh, subtract one from that unique identifying number, and we knew that weld uh, was a bad weld. So we have our data, um, but processing is required to aggregate uh, both level one and, and level two information for uh, uh, the, the process variables and their set points, as well as the, the gauge and grade. Um, there's lots of solutions out there in the market. Uh, there, there's free solutions, R, Python. There's, there's third-party solutions, such as what we offer, uh, which is Cortex. Um, and you can, you can see the uh, data here as it is summarized, um, where we've given each weld a unique identifying number, uh, looked at gauge, grade, uh, and then the parameters used to make the weld, uh, such as leading weld force, amps, everything that Albert talked about earlier. Um, and some vari variations therein, uh, and then whether or not that weld passed or failed the operator inspection. So now that we had our data, we wanted to build a machine learning model which could accurately predict the probability of an operator determining a reweld is necessary. Um, so recall how uh, the the operator, it's really their judgment call when they look at a, a weld uh, and how it failed in the bulge test, uh, and it was up to them to determine whether or not they were going to allow that weld forward in the process <clears throat> versus rewelding it. Uh, so we collaborated with site experts to identify relevant variables with the uh, uh, with the Taylor Winfield welder, uh, gathered that data, aggregated it like I uh, just mentioned, um, and uh, began modeling. So we first looked at uh, Bayesian networks. Um, that is a probabilistic model. So when we're talking about the probability of an operator passing or failing, you could have the exact same weld and one operator passes it and another one fails it out of an abundance of caution. Um, so with the uh, Bayesian network, we're you actually using machine learning to extract meaningful relationships in the data. Um, and our resulting model uses historical data and current evidence to generate a prediction and a probability of that prediction being correct. So uh, for those who are unfamiliar with uh, conditional probability, I've got a um, uh, slightly simplified visual for educational purposes here. Um, uh, but if you take all of our data and subset it by coils, which match the metallurgical and physical properties that we're considering, uh, and we subset that data by the set points we're considering to make a weld, we can look at the resulting data um, and the ratio of welds which failed versus welds which, which haven't failed. Um, uh, and that, that is uh, conditional probability. Um, and then you can easily see that by using the same method and comparing two different sets of set points, we have set points A here, um, we can look at uh, set points A versus B, and just in the data, uh, what the probability of failing using uh, set points A and B. Um, so again, slightly simplified uh, 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 explanation of, of what is going on in the model, but that is uh, uh, at its core what Bayesian statistics and conditional probability is looking at. Um, but this method only works if it's accurate. For instance, you can include the name of the operator or the time of the day the weld was made, and it'll give you a technical result here, right? Um, but uh, we're concerned with accuracy of the model uh, or of the prediction. Uh, and that's where modeling using machine learning comes in. So by reserving some of the data, we can use that data that the model hasn't seen to test the accuracy of the model. Um, and so that is what we did inside of our Cortex software. Um, we generated a model that was able to give us uh, accurate predictions on the test data as to whether or not a good weld was achieved. Um, so you can see we can apply evidence to this model and it gives us a prediction as to what the probability of having a good weld is. <clears throat> so like I said, we had a very accurate model, um, but an accurate model doesn't necessarily mean uh, business results. So uh, even if we were to deploy a live model uh, right next to the operator, we needed to inform their decisions before a bad weld was made. 
So operators really needed a prescriptive solution to tell them what set points were really important with, uh, uh, when making a weld. For that, inside of Cortex, we actually have a feature called Auto Evidence. It allows you to input known variables. So in this case, uh, we, we input um, uh, grade and gauge uh, and, and the fact that we're hitting all of our set points. Um, and it gives you an output of a combination of, of set points uh, with the highest likelihood of passing a weld. Um, and so in our analysis, we, we did this and we combined the results into a table for operators to use. Uh, and so that gave them a prescriptive solution uh, that uh, allowed them to make an informed decision before the weld was actually made. Um, and so I'm gonna turn it back over to Albert to talk about uh, uh, the results we had with the project and, and uh, how we incorporated it into their operations. Thank you, Andrew. So well, how Andrew well explained, we at the end of this, we had a set of tables per material to be tested. Uh, most of them, they have, um, let's say half and half, we have uh, some with huge changes and some with the slight changes. And then we, we had a, a big discussion and analysis, how were we going to implement this? So the very first thing that we need, we, we understood was that we needed to have the operator on board of this for the reason that the operator can change the uh, first operator needs to select the, the set points. This is the most important thing. Second, the operator needs to have the ability to modify the set point if he doesn't feel good with it. So because the operator has a huge impact in this, we needed to have the operator on board. Then um, we chose or to work only with one operator at the same time, to have this control only in day shift and only when we were present. And then we show the uh, operator that has the most experience. Uh, in this case, the operator with most experience was also the most skeptical operator. And this is very uh, important because this is a key of how we found, um, how we were successful that fast. The operator gave us with no filter, his opinion about uh, what really was happening with the equipment. He didn't tell us what we wanted to hear. He, tell us, he told us the truth. So, and with no filter, that was very important because as soon as, soon as we selected to start with the easy to weld materials and easy to weld um, uh, thickness. We started testing this with the operator and the operator gave us two kinds of feedbacks. The first feedback was, yes, guys, this is working perfect. And the second feedback was, um, this is not working perfect. You need to adjust something else that I don't know, but you need to adjust, adjust something because it's not working well. And so <clears throat> we went with the model uh, many times with uh, Andrew and to make it uh, the fine tuning. Something important to mention here is the operator is the one that selects the set point. The operator is the one that is responsible for the inspection of the weld and he has the responsibility to approve the weld seam to go into the into the line. So if something happened he is accountable for that reason, for that decision. And then um, also if something happened with the weld and something is not good, either a wood rig weld or a, a strip break, the operator is the one that needs to run the extra mile and work more to solve the problem. So this is very important how uh, or why we selected this uh, best and more skeptical with a lot of feedback, no filter operator. So with all the data that we have from the operator, we uh, use the continually improvement model that is displayed now. First, we gather all the data, we analyze the data, and then, then uh, we had the, the first model. Then we implemented the first tables, and we started uh, testing the table with the operator, and the operator gave us many data that we analyzed. Andrew were able, <clears throat> excuse me, was able to fine tuning the model and to 
uh, have the new set of tables that we tested it. And then this is an iterative process that we made many times until we reach the perfect tables. Okay. Um, after we tested all the easy to weld materials and uh, easy to weld uh, grades and thickness, we needed to jump to the non-easy uh, field. So in that moment, we had the operator on board with us and we included the rest of the operator because we wanted to um, do it in all the shift at the same time. And then we selected the non-easy to weld materials. We uh, applied the tables one by one and uh, the operators gave us the feedback of how the material was being uh, welded first with the Bosch test. And then in that moment, we had another feedback that we didn't use in the first moment. It was very important that when the weld seam reach or uh, how, uh, Pro, it's process for all the entry, all the process in the line, it goes and reach the exit. Uh, we had in some cases, uh, well seams that looks perfect at the entry, but at the exit, they didn't look so perfect. So we adjusted again, all the parameters, and then this is what led us to have um, uh, the perfect tables to eliminate the rewelds and uh, strip breaks in those materials. In the next slide, we are going to show how did we implement the tables. We started the project in January 20, 2019. And in April 2019, we started implementing the set of tables with the easy to weld materials. And then that was a process that took two months. And around June 2019, we started implementing the table for the non, non easy to weld materials and we finish all the scope by the end of the year. So um, after we implemented the table for all, all the selected materials, we eliminated the rewells and we also eliminated the um, strip break. That was a, a very successful project and that has a huge impact in the, in the process. Okay, this is uh, what we wanted to show you uh, in behalf of Big River Steel, on point and in all the people that participate in this project we wanted to thank you well i'd like to thank you uh for that great presentation Albert and andrew it was really very uh, informative to see a practical um, implementation of artificial intelligence and machine learning in a in a very tangible uh operation uh, i think we've got some questions here that i'd like to move to if you could go to the next slide uh, I think even the one there you go. So um, one of the items that you mentioned, Albert, uh, was the experience of your skeptical operator. I thought that was very, very humorous, but uh, the ones with more experience tend to be a little more skeptical. But uh, in this particular project, um, how much of the success uh, was dependent on the tool and how much success was uh, dependent on the feedback that you got from your individual operators and the other people involved? Uh, very good question, Chris. Um, in, in, I mean, every company is different, but in this company, uh, the operators are very important because the guy or the guys are the one that can choose the right or wrong set point and makes a huge change. So how much depends? I would like to say that uh, it's a mix between the, we need to use the tools, all the, the, the most complicated in automation to give the operator the best uh, knowledge or best information to help him to make the decision. And then here is a very important uh, aspect um, because uh, when the, we have all totally automatic process, um, we don't have, um, let's say, when we don't have a totally automated process, we can guarantee that we are going to do exactly the same always. This is a uh, positive, but we are not taking into consideration two, two variables, that the material and something can happen in the material that we are going to weld and the second aspect is that the operator is the one at the end 
that will select or will choose to send the coil or not. So I would like to say that will be a 50-50, uh, but the operator is a, a huge uh, uh, impact in this project. Yeah, I think just to echo on that, Albert, um, I, I think uh, uh, that they are just as important. The, the people are just as important as the tools because uh, one of my favorite sayings in the, in the maintenance world is uh, that the equipment doesn't know that you're talking about it. So you can do all the analytics uh, that you want, um, but until you act on it and people actually pushing the buttons and doing the maintenance uh, and, and working the equipment, uh, it, until that behavior changes, uh, the, the analysis means nothing. Um, so uh, I, I think uh, the, the people are just as important as the tools um, and, and partnering with uh, uh, people who are willing to make those changes. Like Albert said, we, we met with the most skeptical operator and, and really got his buy-in on, uh, are, are you okay being, being the lead on this experiment? Um, uh, and, and I think that was just uh, very powerful uh, for the op other operators and other people in the line to see that, hey, we're making these improvements and this problem that we used to be talking about uh, every day, um, you know, Albert said uh, uh, at least once a month uh, this would happen uh, is no longer a problem anymore. So. Okay, I appreciate that insight. And I, I guess our second question, if you go to the next page, um, really just dives a little bit deeper in terms of those, um, <clears throat> you know, those operators and how you sort of gain their confidence. Uh, I, I would imagine, you know, based on their experience and looking at the wells and, and uh, you know, the, by eye, they're probably making their own decision. How did they develop confidence uh, in the analytical solution? What was that process like? Uh, that, that was very interesting and a lot of analysis that we made uh, regarding this. And we took data and the data we have is this. First, the operator is the one that is responsible for the well seam. The operator is the one that is going to make the decisions, decision to send it to process or not. Um, if the line is not uh, in production, the operator's salary is being affected. So it's very important that we are going to touch a very sensitive topic here, that we are going to affect the, the operator. And we understood, I mean, in the steel industry is not very common to have uh, an operator with engineering degrees. So our ability was understand the process deeply understand the modeling that we made, understand every single variable and how this can affect to have a good or bad wealth, and then go with the operator side by side with him and explain with a very easy to understand and common language, something that is very complicated because we need the operator to understand or to fully understand what was happening. As soon as we explained the operator, and he understood what was happening and how were we going to solve the problem with his help, that was the, let's say, the solution for that equation. I appreciate that, Albert. I don't know if Andrew wanted to add, so I was sort of giving him a second to say anything about that, but certainly, uh, go ahead. Yeah, I think, uh... I think Albert hit on a key point there, which is uh, to to put it in terms that that means something to them, right? So that can be uh, showing them data uh, that that can be doing these uh, small tests on uh, uh, hey, th this is what the analysis shows. These are the set points. How how do these look to you? Does this make sense? Um, uh, and when we did that with the easy to weld material. Uh, and, and the operators were like, yeah, everybody knows how to weld that. Um, uh, but it built that confidence. It was that first stepping stone. And once we started to take that journey, uh, each subsequent step was easier and easier. Um, <clears throat> so I, I remember I wasn't there at the plant at the, at the time, but uh, there was one set of set points that, that we had provided that the operator, operator was very skeptical of. Uh, and one of the uh, process engineers um, was out there with them and uh, they went ahead and made the weld uh, and, and just to, 
uh, hear the story of the look on the operator's face, like just just joy uh, to see that this this hard to weld material um, came out perfect. And uh, the comment was made that that's the best weld I've ever seen on that material. Um, you know, all of those little steps uh, get you to that spot where now we you've got the confidence of the operators uh, that hey maybe these analytical solutions have something to offer. Um, uh, and that we can learn from. So, well, we've got one last question about the operators, um, and then we'll move into a couple of questions that have been submitted online here. But in in terms of you know the operator themselves, what was the higher priority? Did you feel like it was um, allowing the operator to make a better decision, or having the operator turn the decision over to the algorithms completely? Did did, did they feel like they were being removed from the equation, or? What was what was the higher priority in that respect? Do you want to answer that one, Albert? I would like to say that starting <clears throat> the operator was a uh, has zero confidence uh, with the algorithm when he started seeing that the well seen consistently was a good quality. He started believing in this, and then. He was one of the ones that started pushing us to say, hey, when are we going to go to test the, the most difficult grades? So we said that we, one moment, it's good that you are, you are uh, on board, but we need to do this to prevent to have uh, an street break because every single street break that could happen inside the furnace is uh, 30 hours of production is a cost that we cannot afford. That's good. I'm glad to hear that, uh, you know, they, they were buying into that. Um, some of the questions that have been submitted online are a little, like, you know, touch on that operator and some of the details that they're going to, you know, include in their decision making. And one of them had to do with timing. Um, if you could give a rough estimate of what is the timing between the weld taking place and the bulge test or being able to to make that decision? How long does that operator have to make that decision? Okay, the, the well seam is made and then we need to move the well seam from the welder to the notcher that takes five seconds and we perform the, the, the notches and the operator have 20 seconds to test every single notch. And, and uh, related to that, um, you know, the test data itself was there any sort of uh, specific criteria that helped to determine, um, you know, if, if the crack was one centimeter versus five centimeters, or if there was no crack? Was there any criteria that was collected on the results of the bulge test? Uh, yeah, the operators, I mean, this is only based in experience. And when we were uh, trained by the OEM, the, the trainers, they show us this weld should break perpendicular to the weld. I mean, the fracture, the crack, should be perpendicular to the crack, to the um, uh, weld seam. But that is with a specific thickness. If we are talking about all the full scope or all the thickness from thinner to thicker, it's not a 100% a, a, a rule that we can apply. So that depends mainly of the experience. And we, uh, we were lucky. We have people here from different companies. We are a new company that we have. We, let's say, we have people from many, many companies, many steel makers. And then we have people that help us to determine when a well see uh, how a bulge text, test looks like when it's good and how it looks bad per thickness, uh, thicker, thinner and medium thickness. So was that, was that um, analysis one of the parameters that you put into the, uh, the, the um, AI uh, evaluation, Andrew? Was that uh, a variable? Uh, in the no, you're, you're talking about uh, potentially looking at a, a image of how the weld failed. Um, right. that, that was not considered. Um, we uh, you know, it, it potentially could if you look at, you know, future applications of, of machine learning and AI uh, in this line. Um, uh, but we, we didn't talk about it, but for this whole project, we uh, wanted to go as simple as possible. Um, okay. And so 
uh, had we needed to go that far into depth, add new equipment, add cameras and things like that, uh, that's something we could have done, but ultimately we didn't need to um, because we could just use uh, the data that we had. Um, so that's, that's another thing I think that's a, a common misconception is that uh, you, you, you need to get more data when, when sometimes you can just use the data that you already have to answer the questions. Okay. I was leading into another question that, that came into uh, the chat um, as a result. Um, they wanted to know what were the parameters um, which were um, results that the uh, AI implementation could, could you know, uh, have for the operator. What, what other parameters were involved in, in that decision-making process. And I, I know you kind of showed it on a slide, but it was kind of difficult to read, but I don't know if there's a, a list. Uh, obviously, um, you know, you want to try and take certain uh, values like the thickness of the steel into account, but were there any other parameters that you could share? Uh, right. It, it's, uh, there, there was no uh, special um, uh, parameter that was identified that, that uh, somebody familiar in welding would not uh, already suspect it was the combination of the parameters uh, and this and the set points that the operator uses um, and and when uh, the the thickness what what break at which you need to change that that's that's what machine learning really got us is for this range of thicknesses and grades you need to use these range of set points um, and you'll get a good weld so um, but uh, leading weld force, trailing weld force, planisting force, uh, amps, um, all of those typical um, uh, variables were included in that analysis um, and ultimately what we gave the operator. So there, there wasn't anything special there. I think early on in the process, uh, Albert, we did identify a, a mechanical deficiency that was rectified with, with a, a technician that was brought in. Um, uh, and again, that, that was something that that wasn't looked at, uh, or sorry, not wasn't looked at, but wasn't considered when they were doing their individual analysis. But when we looked at the data holistically, we said, hey, this is a problem, so. Okay, um, one of the questions that came in in terms of the sources of data was early on, you mentioned that uh, the development was based off of using uh, IBA and looking at that, that data. Was, was that the source of the data analysis or did you guys have a separate uh, tool that was collecting that data for, for um, tuning the algorithm and making the decision on whether it's a good well? So all of our modeling for this project was done on Cortex, which is our online platform okay. uh, that uh, uh, allows uh, either uh, a, a non-point employee like myself or an, an operator to take that data and build a model and use machine learning to look for those correlations. So that was really uh, uh, the analysis tool that was used, that's our Cortex software. Okay, I, I was more, I think the question was more based on the source of data itself. Uh, that was a, uh, an on-prem, um, you know, archive of, of all the data points related to that were being collected or if that was, uh, you know, some other tool that was being used to collect the source of data itself. Yeah, IBA and then the, the uh, higher level systems, right, Albert? Sorry. Yes, sir, that's correct. Okay, um, a couple of other questions have just come in here, so give me a second. Um, uh, one of the questions is, was the, it more difficult to transition this process to higher alloy grade steels uh, when you started off with some of the easier wells or, or was it uh, similar to heavier gauges of steels? Was, was it, um, I guess the question here is, were higher alloy grades of steel more difficult or were heavier gauges uh, of steel more difficult to transition to? Uh, definitely the high alloy steel grades, they were the, they were difficult, the most difficult. Um, uh, the, all the metallurgics, they, I mean, they know well this, how the system, uh, there is not very easy to weld two materials that they have a uh, high alloy. So, um, let's suppose with a, a very common material, we can just weld with a table and, and we can put the table, the same table with a with high alloy steel and we can just break apart this with your hands. So 
the high alloy for sure were more more difficult than the thickness. Okay, I think that's really practical, and I think that a lot of the attendees for these types of uh, virtual uh, webinars appreciate the practical feedback that you're able to provide. So much appreciated. Uh, I think we got time for uh, one more question here. Um, is is the model able to predict that the automatic feedback uh, is drifting or is failing or is suspect in any way? Uh, so this isn't a, we did not have a live model um, for this data. Uh, any sort of drift um, uh, would be detected by uh, their systems um, on on-prem. So we did not have to implement a live model for this solution. Uh, what we did was um, uh, roughly every month, every two months, we would get more data, uh, uh, scrub that, put it into the model, and see where the resulting optimum set points were. Um, it wasn't uh, due to, um, uh, just due to the nature of the project, it didn't require a live implementation. So. Andrew, uh, I would like just to put something there that um, this was, a, we used the IBA data that the IBA data is known as a batch. So we, we had the file after the file, I mean, we have, we can read the file after the file is created. So it's a batch. Uh, Andrew will explain this in the presentation. If we want to use an online model, we can use the data from the IBA. We, but there are many solutions that we can do is uh, connecting the PLC straight uh, with on real time communication to the model and the model should be able to predict online in real time if the well seen is going to be good or not. Okay, okay. Well, that was a pretty quick answer. I guess I can slip in one last question here. I guess this is more to Andrew. Is, um, is related to the, the data analysis. Um, the the uh, attendee is asking, uh, how did you clean out any bad or garbage data um, from in, 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 the, uh, in the machine learning process? Uh, I mean, I imagine the, the question uh, imagines that you have some sort of uh, problem with the, the transformer or the wrong feedback or current data that might have been causing some problems. But how do you take a look at pulling out that bad data? Yeah, so um, <clears throat> sometimes data is stored in, in time series. It's obvious you get, uh, uh, you get some sort of indication or feedback that the, uh, the, the, the data isn't good. Um, uh, I'm trying to think, this, it's been a while since uh, we actually did this project. Uh, that, that didn't happen very often, uh, but th there's a lot of uh, methods you can use uh, to, to clean data, uh, look for outliers, uh, things like that. Um, but uh, it, it really didn't uh, have any impact in, in this project in particular. There's also uh, machine learning uh, algorithms that can handle missing data and handle bad data. And if you, if you label it as such, it can actually use that uh, to the advantage of the model as well. So. Okay, thank you. Oh, and, and just one last question that I should get to here real quick uh, has to do with the process. Um, Albert, uh, the question was, is there any grinding after the weld? Oh, no. After the weld, we have a planishing involved. No, we don't have a grinding in this um, uh, dual lab uh, tail with the welder. Okay, thank you. Sorry, that, that just wanted to round off the questions that have come in. Well, that really does take us to the end of the uh, presentation and question and answer series. I really want to thank uh, Albert and Andrew for the presentation and thank the AISD staff for putting this together. Um, it's Unfortunate we couldn't meet in Pittsburgh, but I think this is a very, very good tool for us to educate the AIST membership. And I'd like to turn it back over to Alicia for the wrap up. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chris. So thank you very much, Albor and Andrew, for a very interesting presentation today. 
Um, before we end the webinar, um, I would also like to brief you on upcoming AAST webinars. The next upcoming webinar here at AAST is advice for the steel industry's young professionals on navigating the current marketplace. And it's going to be held Tuesday, 21st of July at 1 to 2 p.m. Eastern time. The speakers are Gareth Urey from Stelco, uh, Patrick Quinney and Caleb Fitch from Nucor Steel and Lauren Keating from Songer Steel Service. The upcoming next, next digital transformation webinar is by Danielli Automation and the presenter is Gina Verbanik. Uh, the title of her presentation is Application of Machine Learning for Detective Coil Prediction. And it's going to be scheduled on Wednesday, 8th of July at 10 to 11 a.m. So please do not forget to register for those webinars. I would also like to mention that the Digital Transformation Forum for the Steel Industry is scheduled to be held 15th to 17th of March 2021 at the Omni William Penn Hotel in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Um, the call for abstracts is currently open and the deadline to submit one is uh, 25th of September. To submit your abstract, please visit AIST.org, then go to Conference Expositions, then Technology Training, Digital Transformation Forum, and then Abstract Submittal. I would like to thank all of you for attending the webinar today. Uh, please do not forget to uh, fill out a survey at the end of this webinar. Uh, it's very helpful for us um, to evaluate the quality and also to plan and make the webinars better for the future. Um, so hereby I would like to thank you uh, very much and I hope to see you at uh, the upcoming digital transmission webinars and the other AIST webinars as well. Thank you.